Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's very special occasional lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and to pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. You would have been asleep for the week if you've missed the fact that it's the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta um, this week. It's um, an event that's hugely significant in our systems of government, our respect for the rule of law, and all those fine things that we derive in many senses from the Magna Carta. And I'm extremely honoured today to be able to um, introduce Her Excellency Mrs Mena Rawling, CMG, the British High Commissioner, to present a lecture to you today on the Magna Carta, uh, what it meant then, what it means today, and uh, I'm sure that you will find today's lecture fascinating. Now, Mrs Rawlings has been lucky in a way. She's arrived uh, in Canberra just a couple of months ago in April to begin her posting as uh, British High Commissioner. So she's arrived with all this excitement going on and um, I'm sure that she's been to many functions already in relation to the Magna Carta. Of course, this week on Monday in the Great Hall, there was a, a reception. Um, the, the Magna Carta, Australia's copy of the Magna Carta, which dates from 1297 and is usually on display in an exhibition on the Senate side on this floor, was actually moved. <gasps> with great trepidation from that site into the Great Hall for the function and for filming of Q&A later that evening. Um, I haven't checked, but I presume it's safely back in its uh, accustomed spot. Now, while the actual anniversary is considered to have been the 15th, there is some controversy. Historians wouldn't be historians if there wasn't some controversy. And there is a, a school of thought by some um, very well-respected historians that the date that we should be celebrating the sealing of Magna Carta is actually today. So you are very lucky here to be, to be here today on the alternative uh, potential and 800th anniversary of this wonderful artefact and document. But let me not go on. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Mrs Mena Rawlings to give today's occasional lecture. Please join me in welcoming her. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody, and thank you very much, Rosemary, for that kind introduction and for the invitation to speak to you all today. Uh, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and elders past and present. I should also like to thank Rosemary and her colleagues for selecting a start time of just about 12.15 for a lecture that, about an event that occurred exactly, apparently, 800 years ago. Um, I'm not decided on whether this was just a happy accident or a very clever means of ensuring that I turned up at the right time, but thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, the history of Magna Carta is an epic one, spanning as it does 800 years and being concerned with a great many lofty ideals about justice, freedom and the rule of law. But at heart, it's also a great story. So I'd like to begin my speech today by telling that tale, complete with its cast of colourful, but generally speaking, pretty nasty characters. Then I'll have a go at explaining how Magna Carta made the leap from English legal history to internationally recognised symbol of liberty and what that means for us today. Then, if I could be so bold, I would like to end by laying out briefly what a Magna Carta for the 21st century might look like. But to be begin at the beginning, when the curtain lifts on Act 1 of our story, we find ourselves in England in the year 1215, a year racked by civil war. On one side, the grasping King John seeks to bring his rebellious barons to heel. They, tired of the king's continuous efforts to raise taxes by picking their pockets, seek to curb his powers. The stage for this opening scene is an unassuming one, a place called Runnymede, not much more than a meadow next to a bend in the River Thames. In 1215, there was no particular significance to this location. It just happened to be far enough away from the Baron's base in the city of London and not too close to the King's fortress of Windsor Castle. 
It's still there, of course, although the surrounding area is a little bit more developed these days. If you've flown in or out of London's Heathrow Airport, you've probably passed over the very spot where this momentous piece of history occurred. King John and the barons had met there to thrash out the terms of a peace deal that would end the Civil War, and in doing so, almost by accident, they would sketch out the framework, what we now call the rule of law. The cast of our play are a fairly gruesome bunch. King John, as anyone who's seen a film or a TV version of Robin Hood will know, was a thoroughly nasty piece of work. And if anything, the script writers of modern times have been quite kind. The barons who opposed him were certainly not interested in establishing a fundamental system of rights for the common man. They were concerned only for their own rights. Their talk of rights of freeborn Englishmen meant themselves and others of their class, not common folk. Despite a great deal of bad blood and very little mutual trust, the two sides came to an agreement of sorts, essentially a set of rules that laid down for the first time how the king should govern the country. The 63 clauses that make up what we now call Magna Carta were copied out on parchment, the treated skins of sheep. Of the four surviving copies of the 1215 Magna Carta, each is a different size and shape according to the dim dimensions of the piece of parchment it was written on, but the words are essentially identical. So what do those words say? And more importantly, what do they really mean? It's a bit of a hodgepodge of a document, really. Unsurprisingly, there's a lot about taxation of various kinds, as this was what the war had been about. There's a lot of attention to inheritance, dowries for widows and the like, all of which were very important to the aristocracy back then, but frankly, of much less relevance today. The interests of the merchants and guilds in the city of London, who'd thrown their lot in with the rebels, are reflected in some very practical stuff about weights and measures and freedoms of traders to move about the country unobstructed by fish weirs. Clearly a big thing in 1215, but of less obvious relevance now. As an aside, however, I'm reliably informed that the fish weir clause gave rise eventually to a public right of fishing, which was then transferred over to Australia. Indeed, Magna Carta was cited as recently as 2010 in a submission to the New South Wales Upper House by the Canberans, Canberra Fishermen's Club. That suggests that the clause has survived the test of time rather better than many others. It also suggests that picking a legal argument with the Canberra Fishermen's Club would be a very bad idea. <laughs> but we must return to the matters at hand in 1215. Magna Carta also outlines some very important and practical reforms to the administration of justice and local government. Petitioners for the King's justice no longer need to follow his court around the country, for example. But tucked away in all this talk of the machinery of medieval government is one particular sentence which elevates Magna Carta from a moderately interesting historical document to the foundation of the rule of law. And in later centuries, the inspiration behind our system of democracy and belief in human rights. This sentence is usually known as Clause 39 from its place in the original text. And if you don't mind, I will quote it in full. It says, no free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or disseized or outlawed or exiled or in any other way ruined, nor will we go or send against him except by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. This clause is considered to be of such fundamental importance to our system of law that it remains part of the English legal code today. The next clause adds, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. There are other clauses in Magna Carta which still have resonance, but for me, these two sentences are why this 800-year-old piece of parchment still matters today. These statements, they change something fundamental about the relationship between a people and the government, in this case, a king that ruled them. The power of that government was no longer absolute. A crucial principle had been established that no man was above the law, not even the king. The fact that 800 years later, I'm standing in a parliament on the other side of the world talking about Magna Carta suggests strongly that in the long run, at least, it proved to be a success, but it didn't get off to a great start. The peace that it was supposed to guarantee lasted just a few weeks. King John himself only lasted another 16 months before dying, most likely of dysentery, while on campaign with his army. 
he wasn't much lamented. The chronicler Matthew Paris, writing some 40 years later, noted that, foul as it is, hell itself is made fouler by the presence of John. As you can tell, John had made a lasting impression on his subjects, and it wasn't a good one. For the purposes of our story, though, John's death was crucial. It brought his nine-year-old son, Henry III, to the throne, and the boy king's advisers needed a way to bolster his legitimacy as ruler and to rally more allies to the king's side. So they reissued Magna Carta, first in 1216 and then again the next year. Over time, this began to have the desired effect. In fact, it proved to be such a successful tactic that the king was to reissue or restate his commitment to Magna Carta every five years or so throughout his long reign, which lasted until 1272. His son, Edward I, then continued the tradition, issuing what is usually considered to be the definitive version of Magna Carta in 1297. It is a copy of that document that is kept here in Parliament House, the one Rosemary was talking about earlier on, but I'll come back to that later. The repeated publication of Magna Carta throughout the 13th century is a useful lesson for all of us involved in the public discussion of government policy. It isn't enough to just say something once, however important it is. You have to keep saying it again and again until as many people as possible get the message. This remains tr as true today as it was 800 years ago. Indeed, Alastair Campbell, one of our most famous spin doctors, who was director of government communications under Prime Minister Tony Blair, used to say that it's only when you feel physically sick of hearing the same old message that other people are just about getting it. So each time Magna Carta was reissued or reaffirmed, the document had to be diligently and carefully copied out by hand and estimated 50 times so it could be distributed around the country. So I think we should save our sympathy for the aching fingers of the poor scribes charged with this painfully tedious task. But it was thanks to this regular reissuing and reaffirming of Magna Carta and a lot of hard work by those scribes that by the start of the 14th century, the process of getting that message across was essentially complete. Magna Carta had cemented its place as the bedrock of English law. And with that, the first act of our story draws to a close. The second part of Magna Carta's story concerns how a set of rules designed to constrain a medie medieval English king took on a much greater significance and in doing so leapt oceans, helped give birth to new nations and made its way here to the very parliament in which we sit. Between Acts 1 and 2 of our story there is a short interlude of about 300 years and we pick up the plot again in the early part of the 17th century. The political situation at the time might have been familiar to our cast of characters from 1215, though the fashions had moved on a bit. England again faced tensions between a king, Charles I, who was perceived to be behaving in a tyrannical manner, and the governing class, who were no longer barons but members of parliament. As in the 13th century, money, or rather the lack of it, was the cause of much of this tension. The king needed money, but could only raise it with the support of Parliament. They were unwilling to provide it without conditions. These tensions would eventually lead to a terrible series of civil wars that would see the British Isles devastated, the king deposed, and eventually executed. That's certainly a topic for another lecture and another lecturer. But what makes it part of today's story is that the legal and philosophical opposition to the Stuart kings was, at least in part, based on Magna Carta. Of course, Magna Carta was even then a 400-year-old document, so, so its proponents interpreted in an, it in a new light, one that better reflected their political considerations of their day. But rooting their new ide ideas on the foundations of ancient liberties established by Magna Carta gave them greater legitimacy and more persuasive power. And here's where our tale takes an international turn. At the same time as Magna Carta was once again being cited as a touchstone for individual freedoms, many people were leaving the British Isles for America. Many of those were fleeing political and religious persecution, and it's easy to see why a great charter guaranteeing ancient rights might have had enormous appeal to them as they began a new life in the new world. Thus, it was ideas stemming from Magna Carta that in the next century would be expressed first as no taxation without representation, would then find form in the United States 1776 Declaration of Independence. Some of the language in the Declaration, and even more notably in the Bill of Rights that followed 20 or so years later, is unmistakably similar to Magna Carta. 
Perhaps then it's not surprising that the Charter's image is proudly displayed on the doors of the US Supreme Court. Slightly more surprising is that the Magna Carta Memorial at Runnymede, inscribed with the words to commemorate Magna Carta, symbol of freedom under law, was paid for by the American Bar Association. Having influenced the founding fathers of the United States of America, Magna Carta would continue to inspire others charged with drafting the constitutions of new or newly independent nations. Its distinctive style can be found in the constitutions of Australia, Canada, India, and many other Commonwealth countries. Given the historical connections between these countries and the UK, the home of Magna Carta, perhaps we shouldn't be too surprised at that. But the influence of this 800-year-old piece of sheepskin has grown far beyond the Anglosphere and the Commonwealth. In 1948, as Eleanor Roosevelt was chairing the committee charged with drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, she described it as the International Magna Carta for All Mankind, and the influence of the original is clear to see in the final version of her committee's work. A more recent example of Magna Carta's influence can be found in the Charter of the Commonwealth, which was only adopted in December 2012. It's worth noting, too, that the countries of the Commonwealth clearly see the continued relevance of a written charter of rights, responsibilities and values in the 21st century. That's something that I hope to build on in the final part of my talk today. But having noted, noted Magna Carta's influence on Australia's constitution, I don't intend to try to discuss it in detail. In this 800th anniversary year, there'll be plenty of opportunities to hear other far better qualified speakers on that topic. In fact, an earlier Senate occasional lecture by Harry Evans from way back in 1997 covered this ground brilliantly. It would be remiss of me, though, to note that Canberra is one of only two cities outside the United Kingdom to play host to a copy of Magna Carta. The other is Washington, D.C., and they only unveiled theirs as recently as 2008, nearly 50 years after Canberra's was first put on display. The story of Australia's, how Australia's Magna Carta came to take up residence in this building is a fascinating one, with its own cast of quirky characters and plot twists aplenty. I'm sure I won't be able to do it justice, so I will only recommend that you seek out a copy of Professor Nicholas Vincent's essay on the subject, helpfully, and I've got a prop. Here it is. It's just been republished in an excellent book uh, alongside many other great essays on Australia's Magna Carta, including the one by Harry Evans I just referred to, and a particularly fascinating one by Rosemary. And it's available in the bookshop for $10. <laughs> That's the plug over. We've now told the story of how Magna Carta came into being and how its influence has spread and grown right up until the present day. But what of the future? And why is it that people like myself, representing the British government, still feel that it has more to give the world? Certainly one part of the answer to the last question is that Magna Carta is a topic close to the heart of our current Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, and not just because he represents the constituency of Runnymede and Weybridge in our own House of Commons. It's because the rule of law is the crucial, necessary element that provides the foundations for a successful society. I'm going to quote um, our Foreign Secretary, if, if I may, in a speech that he gave earlier this year in London. He said... The foreign policy of a democratic nation must have a single unifying goal, the relentless pursuit of the long-term enlightened national interest, that is, the interest of its citizens, present and future. But that is not to suggest that projection of our values is relegated to the margins of foreign policy making. On the contrary, the rule of law, good governance, and the accountability that rests on equality before the law and freedom of speech these are the building blocks of successful societies and the very expression of our national self-interest. And since successful societies are the building blocks of the global security and prosperity to which our nation aspires, so the rule of law, good governance, accountability are fundamental enablers of our own national security and prosperity objectives. End of quote. I think this expresses most clearly why while the parchment that Magna Carta was written on might have aged, the concept of the rule of law that first found expression in its words has not. And it is my firm belief that it will not lose its significance any time soon. Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me. 
Having completed the second part of our story, we now move on to the third and final act, in which the narrator, that's me, muses on the significance of it all and perhaps unwisely attempts to draw some conclusions. So, in the run-up to this, the 800th anniversary of the sealing of Magna Carta, I've been thinking about what a Magna Carta for the 21st century might look like. Firstly, a disclaimer. This isn't the work of a high-level committee of the finest minds in Great Britain. It isn't necessarily the official policy of the British government, and it's neither fully formed nor definitive, so please feel free to suggest other ideas in our discussion afterwards. It does, however, reflect some of the experiences I've had in 25 years of crisscrossing the globe as a British diplomat. And more importantly, perhaps, it's been informed by the aspirations I have for the world that my three children will grow up in. You'll be relieved to know that I think I can express it in six clauses rather than 63. It's not in Latin, and it will be re reproduced on my blog and Twitter account rather than sheep's parchment later on. So here we go. First clause, equal rights for all. No one should be discriminated against on the basis of gender, race, or sexuality. Just taking my own organization, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as an example, it used to be the case that female diplomats had to resign from the diplomatic service when they married. Shockingly, that rule persisted until the 1970s. And we refused to admit homosexual staff into the Foreign Office until 1991, two years after I had joined the organization. We have come a long way on this in recent years. We now have around 40 female heads of mission around the world and a growing number of ambassadors who are from minority groups or indeed openly gay. But there's still much more we can do in the Foreign Office and across each of our societies to reach the stage where men and women of all backgrounds have equality of opportunity and equal pay. The gender pay gap Sorry, the gender pay gap in both Australia and the UK is surprisingly large and is in fact growing, reaching 18.8% in Australia and 19% in the UK in 2014. So my 21st century Magna Carta would address this issue head on, reflecting the changes in our society over the last 800 years or so. There's an obvious fairness, moral argument about why we have to get this right, but the often overlooked point is that discrimination imposes a huge cost on societies by preventing many of our talented people from reaching our full potential, be that in business, civil society, or the arts. And while there's an important role for anti-discrimination legislation, the key to realizing this change is to demonstrate, as I believe we can, that inclusive organizations with diversity at senior levels perform better than those that are homogenous in representation and in ways of thinking. Second clause, that the internet, particularly social media, should be used to promote closer relations between peoples and states, not to propagate hatred and violent extremism. It seems odd to consider something that has only really begun to affect our lives in the last 20 years, and social media is much more recent than that. Twitter has only been with us since 2006, is now of such fundamental importance. After all, most of us managed to get along okay without it. But I've included it here because of its enormous power to communicate across divides, both in the physical sense, so most Brits in Australia, including me, will be familiar with Skyping or FaceTiming friends and family back home, and it can also help to overcome social and cultural barriers. I, this week, in fact, came across some staggering figures about our use of the internet. So every minute, 100,000 tweets are sent, 30 hours of YouTube footage is uploaded, and Google processes more than 2 million search inquiries. That's every minute of every day, and those figures are growing fast. That's why the internet and social media have become our best tools to spread some of the messages we discussed earlier, the importance of the rule of law, good governance, and an accountable democracy. But in recent years, we've been provided with ample evidence that online communication can also be used to spread poisonous ideologies and hatred. Earlier this month, I attended the regional Countering Violent Extremism Summit in Sydney, and I was heartened to hear examples of how we can use strong and positive messages to fight back against those who incite violence and hatred online. It's important that we take effective action to protect some of the most vulnerable in our society from these influences. I left that event certain that the internet is a powerful force for good in the world. 
but it also relies on each of us to, to behave responsibly, to challenge the trolls. It also requires collaboration between government and the technology giants, Facebook, Twitter, Microsoft, Google, Apple, to shut down the voices of extremism and hate without suppressing freedom of expression. I recognize this balance is not an easy one to strike, but in my 21st century Magna Carta, we should at least try. Third clause, freedom of religion. How disappointing it is to think that this issue, which was close to the heart of many people who fled Britain for America in the 17th century, and indeed many others throughout history, still needs to be championed in this the 21st century, but it surely does. As a global community of nations, we must unite in opposition to the politics of hate and the grim view of the world promoted by ISIL and their supporters that justifies killing others purely on the grounds of what they believe. I have a friend and former colleague, Gerard Russell, who's written a brilliant book. I've got a copy here if anyone wants to have a look at it. It's called Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms, Journeys into Disappearing Religions of the Middle East. In it, he ventures into distant, nearly impassable parts of the Middle East, where small and mysterious religions are clinging to survival, but face the possibility of extinction due to, due to the advance of militant extremism. It's a moving reminder that we still can't take our eye off the ball when it comes to freedom of religion. Far from it. Fourth clause, global abolition of the death penalty. We've made huge progress, thank goodness, in 800 years since the Magna Carta on moving away from all kinds of barbaric and degrading punishments. And progress has been made in recent dec dec decades towards the shared UK and Australia goal of global abolition of the death penalty. In 1977, only 16 countries had abolished in law or practice. Today, that number has written to 140, nearly two thirds of countries around the world. Yet in 2014, Amnesty International recorded executions in 22 countries, the same number as 2013. At least 607 executions were carried out worldwide. So we have more to do to achieve our goal to see the total abolition of the death penalty. As UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says, we must continue to argue strongly that the death penalty is unjust and incompatible with fundamental human rights. Fifth clause, a commitment to long-termism. The authors of the original Magna Carta weren't really focused on the long term. It was all about preserving their own short-term interests and pockets, but we are better than that. In our busy, complicated world where we face a constant stream of threats and challenges, I believe we have a shared responsibility to focus on the long term as well as the short term, the important as well as the urgent for our children and our children's children. Two issues I'm thinking of in particular, one is climate change, which can, which can only be tackled holistically as an international community of states working collaboratively and beyond our own borders. That's why the climate change conference in Paris at the end of this year is so important in uniting the world in pursuit of rapid climate action. The second issue I'm thinking of, of is the fight to end poverty, in particular by ensuring that nobody is disadvantaged by their place of birth when it comes to education and healthcare. This is part of the work that began through the Millennium Development Goals, which expire in 2015 this year. These eight goals were set in the year 2000 by 191 UN member countries and included commitments to halve world poverty, reduce child mortality, halt the spread of AIDS and provide universal primary education. Not all of the goals have been reached, but they set the aspiration really high and there have been some real successes. For example, the proportion of people living in extreme poverty has been halved from 46% to 22% of the world's population. There are many more girls in education. We've begun to reverse the spread of HIV and AIDS, and we've halved the proportion of people without access to safe drinking water. There's a lot of important work going on now to decide how we should take this forward and in what form, setting an ambitious post-2015 development agenda. I won't go into the details of that now, but I think this work sits neatly within the framework of a 21st century Magna Carta. Of course, there's a tension between long-termism and short parliamentary cycles, especially when, as in Australia, those cycles only last for three years. So I was heartened to see that before the recent UK general election, the three main party leaders issued a letter which basically said, and I paraphrase, we all agree on climate change, so it isn't an issue in this election. 
This could be a model applied more widely to long-term issues, with party leaders campaigning only on things where they really can make a difference within a three-year time frame. That would be a refreshing change. And that brings me to the sixth and final clause of a 21st century Magna Carta, and it's probably the most important since it underpins almost everything else I've said today. You'll remember that in the quote I read out earlier, our Foreign Secretary stressed the central importance of both our national security and prosperity objectives in how we conduct our foreign policy. He talks about how they're inextricably linked to the way in which we and other countries deal with each other. We know that the world today is facing many challenges, including some that we hoped, had hoped were consigned to the past. Last year, we saw one European country annex the territory of another for the first time since the Second World War. In our own Asia-Pacific region, ter territorial disputes over rocks and reefs have the potential to generate enough friction in international affairs to spark a confrontation. With nations connected like never before, there are few parts of the world that can consider themselves safe from the contagious effects of conflict between states. Even for those countries not directly affected, the global reach of news and the almost universal access to it means there are no more faraway countries of which we know little. That's why in the 21st century, the best hope of resolving these challenges lies in what is sometimes called the rules-based international system. It's a concept that we talk about a lot in diplomatic circles, but what does it mean in layman's terms? Essentially, it means that nations are driven by rules, not power, in how they conduct themselves internationally, so abiding by the rule of law, good governments, and democratic accountability. Of course, we cannot entirely avoid disagreements between countries, but we can try to contain them within the dispute resolution mechanisms of international and regional organizations, such as the United Nations, ASEAN, or the African Union. If we are successful in avoiding the wars, both hot and cold, that so scarred the history of the 20th century, then the prize in, teams of, in terms of peace and prosperity for all our countries is a truly enormous one. That's why the sixth and final principle of my Magna Carta is this, for all states to abide by the rules-based international system. A system that ensures, just as Magna Carta did 800 years ago, that no one, neither king nor country, is above the law. That, ladies and gentlemen, would be worth celebrating for at least another eight centuries. We've covered a lot of ground today from Runnymede to the English Civil War, from Alistair Campbell to Ban Ki-moon, from America to Australia, and from a document written 800 years ago on sheepskin to some ideas for a Magna Carta for this, our 21st century. I hope I have convinced you, at least, that the Magna Carta has relevance and resonance in our complex, globalized world today. So I thank you all for your time and your attention and I look forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, High Commissioner. You've given us an excellent demonstration of why you're such a senior diplomat and uh, some fabulous thought-provoking ideas there including the central idea itself, the idea of a Magna Carta for the 21st century. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, comments or questions from the audience. And uh, as usual in this room, if you have a, a comment or a question, I'd uh, invite you to come to the microphone. There are two of them downstairs and one up in the gallery. And uh, if, if you do have a, a question or a comment, please make your way to the, uh, to the microphone. Uh, but perhaps I'll start, uh, High Commissioner. You, you did mention in relation to the um, use of the internet in the 21st century to promote closer relations. Uh, you did mention that this does obviously set up some kind of tension with the idea of freedom of speech. And uh, th this is freedom of speech is one of those central, I suppose, liberties that we focus on a great deal and, and have done for several hundred years. But um, I don't know if you'd like to comment on how do you think we can, we can manage the internet to, to put limits on hate speech and use of the internet for, for um, 
terrible purposes, as we see. Do, and do you think that governments have a role in this, or it, does it come down to self-regulation or people turning away from that kind of content on the uh, internet? I'd appreciate your thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, I mean, I did touch on it in my speech without actually uh, resolving the issue, but uh, now you're forcing my hand, so, uh, so I'll have a go. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, it, it isn't easy. And, um, you know, certainly in Britain, we, we hold the values behind the idea of freedom of speech very dear, as I know, you know, our friends do in America and obviously in Australia as well. Um, but I think, you know, we are facing a situation which is uh, new and unique in our global history. And I think we do need to find ways of managing that tension, as you put it, between the right to freedom of speech, but our insistence that we shouldn't use tools like the internet to propagate hatred and promote extremism. Um, I can't pretend to have all the answers, but I think there's, there's three sort of components to it. One is government, I think. Um, and uh, in the UK, uh, our new government, our new Conservative government, uh, has announced that we will be uh, introducing a new extremism bill to Parliament. Uh, and the aim of that will be to do more, actually, to clamp down on um, people and organisations which do promote hate through the internet or through uh, preaching or through mosques or other places uh, where people meet. Um, and I think you know, that will try to get at what I call the grey area between what is obviously completely outrageous and very bad and illegal um, and what is okay and part of the freedom of speech. And it's trying to define that grey area um, and take more action in that space, which I think is the key to government intervention. But I'm not pretending it's easy, and I know there'll be a lot of debate about that in the UK. The second area, I think, is industry, and I did mention the, the internet giants. Um, and I think they have got a role, as far as they can, in monitoring what's going on on their websites uh, and on social media and taking action where they see it being misused and goes against their own rules of engagement, if you like. Um, and I know uh, we have very productive conversations um, in Britain, Australia and elsewhere with those companies. And in fact, it was great to see many of them at the summit in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, where well, they were very engaged on this and very much wanted to be part of this agenda. So I think that's promising. Um, the third thing, though, I would say is that it does come down to each of us as individuals. It comes down to people. Um, and at the, to go back to the Sydney summit, somebody gave a presentation and they talked really powerfully about the asymmetry of passion. And what they meant is that at the moment, it's the people with the more extreme views, the people who are propagating hatred and extremism, are taking up a lot of the space um, on the internet. And they had a figure, which I can't quite remember, but it was quite startling of the number of you know, nasty, uh, extremist, violent messages put out on things like Twitter every day. And their pitch was that as individuals, each of us has a role in responding to that and grabbing some of that passion and using it in how we use the internet and challenging that narrative um, and making sure that we, you know, we balance out the use of the internet for that purposes. And I found that, you know, that sort of struck a chord with me um, and something that I'll try and talk to uh, my kids about a bit as well, who of course are much more in the, in the maelstrom of all this. You know, we, we are often uh, observers more of what's happening. Um, so I think if you can get those things right, government, industry and us as individuals, then we'll be able to find a balance and make progress. Mm, thank you. Any questions so far? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Please come to the microphone. I was thinking of offering a prize for the best, best question, but you can always trust the audience. So far. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner. Thank you for a very uh, thought-provoking address, and I was particularly interested in your six principles. You didn't include the rule of law, and I suppose you thought that was given. Um, in a very important address in Australia on Monday at the old Parliament House, uh, the Australian Human Rights Commissioner suggested that the greatest threat to the rule of law came from the increase in executive power, particularly in response to perceived threats of terrorism. My question to you is what principles should guide the community in, on the one hand, addressing the obvious threat of terrorism, and on the other hand, the values we place on the rule of law? 
Thank you. Uh, that's a good question and quite a difficult one, so it might win, might, might win Rosemary's Prize. But um, <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, I, I may not have had the rule of law as a principle, but I think the point is that that's the principle that under, underpins a rules-based international order and a rules-based international system. So, you know, I think what I'm saying is that the rule of law isn't a national concept anymore. It's very much an international concept, and that should be our guiding principle in how we conduct relations between states and between nations. Um, I think, you know, the, the issue around the increase in executive power is one that's part of this difficulty we were referring to earlier on about the balance between freedom um, and um, managing the threat that we face um, from terrorists. And, you know, I think there has to be a balance. I think part of the balance is in our own legislatures, to be honest. So, you know, in the UK, the extremism bill that I've referred to, which probably will notch up um, executive powers a little bit again, will have to go through a very rigorous process of debate. It'll be debated on the floors of the House of Parliament, in the media, in the press. And at the end of the day, I think you know, we are part of a democracy, and that is the role of the democracy, is to challenge, to test, but ultimately to abide by the laws of the state. So um, I think that's where the answer has to lie, and it's incumbent on parliamentarians and those of us who write the laws to bear in mind as well the views of our constituents across our countries and across the international community. Um, does it worry me uh, on a personal level? You know, yes, it does. I mean, I think that balance, we have to keep, keep working towards it, but I'm also confident that our own democratic systems will support that balance and make sure that we achieve the right outcomes. Any further questions? Yes, please come to the microphone, sir. Thank you, and thank you, High Commissioner, for your talk. My question relates to um, how is it that these copies have survived? I mean, they've to survive for 800 years. Now, I read somewhere that the church had something to do with this, because um, I gather there wouldn't have been any official archives. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of how the copies may have survived? Yes, thank you. Um, I may ask Rosemary to help me answer that one. I mean, I think, and I don't know the answer actually, and I think there are you know, lots of different copies around and I'm not the expert on where they are and how they got to where, where, where they are today. Um, I think in recent times, it's a, a lot of very careful preservation of the ones that we do have, um, including by museums and um, institutions. Um, and I guess, you know, as well, the sort of the, the fact that they've lasted in a way is a test testament to their own continuing relevance to our societies um, and perhaps that there were lots of them in the first place so you know some survived but presumably others didn't but um, I'm going to pass to Rosemary to help me out on that one Rosemary. Well I'm no expert either <laughs> High Commissioner but I, I can possibly add a little to the story um, because th there were quite a lot of copies made because the purpose of coming to this agreement signing up this treaty, binding as many people as possible to the terms of, of the treaty. Um, it, it meant that the methods of communication in the 13th century were brought into play. And um, it, it required that many copies of the Magna Carta and similar charters be made so that they could be sent to various parts of the country and promulgated. So, for example, the, the typical places where copies were sent were to the sheriffs of the counties. Um, and also, there was a distribution um, to, to churches as well, so that um, in county courts, in gatherings, the Magna Carta was read aloud and um, read aloud not just once, but, but you know, opening of court sessions, read aloud whenever that occurred. The, the church, I think, has paid a very uh, important role in preservation of copies, um, because if you think of who could read and write in those days, most of that talent was gathered in churches, clerics, clerks, um, who could read and write were engaged scribes in copying out um, various exemplifications of these documents. And, um, and the church had a pretty good record of, of, of um, keeping things in storage. 
And I'll just give you the example of our copy. I mean, how did we get our 1297 copy? How did we find it to buy it in 1952? Well, well the fact is that, that we know that that particular copy was written out by a scribe called Hugh of Yarmouth, his signature's on it, and uh, it was destined for the county of Surrey. And uh, it was sent to the sheriff of the county of Surrey, who also happened to be sheriff of a, a, a nearby county. And um, for safekeeping, it was quite common for documents to be held in monasteries, priories, and uh, we think that this particular copy was safely held in, in um, a, a priory um, in um, Sussex. And uh, it, it stayed there. It was kept in boxes, deed boxes, uh, safe places within the religious institution until the dissolution of the monasteries. And um, from there, our particular copy um, probably went into the hands of a, a, a local lawyer and uh, after a, a few mix-ups, it ended up in a, in a school from, uh, from where it was discovered. So um, th these things are not things that are taken out every day and read. They don't have the wear and tear that, that books in our own libraries might mean. They're precious things. Um, they're taken out from time to time, but they are preserved and protected where they can be found. Um, and, and that's perhaps one answer why, a bit of a long-winded answer, I'm sorry, why, why we've still got, from the 13th century, from the 1200s, why we've still got um, 23 or 24 copies from that time, original issues from that time. And also, vellum's pretty tough, sheepskin's pretty tough. <laughs> but ink fades. It is, in some senses, a miracle. Further questions? Yes? Thank you, Excellency, for a very stimulating speech. And um, I have to say, I concur with all of your thoughts. Perhaps that's because I'm a POM originally. Um, but <coughs> springs to mind, very noble, but who will bell the cat? Um, I think of all the people who have a vested interest in the instability in our world society, all the people who may find their vested interests in conflict with the direction that we as a caring community would like to go. And I think of um, media barons, I think of arms barons, and I think of the politicians who have the task of helping us to create this new world and their conflict of interest. They want to be re-elected. Uh, they want that position of power. But these vested interests have a desire to see them suppressed. And, and, and we have all seen what happens in Britain with the media barons, what, what you went through in the last few years. Um, I think of America wrestling with the arms race and the people who are making so much money. I think of our dependence upon oil and this is what's financing terrorism. Um, so I would like to travel with you. I hope for my sake of my grandchildren, I can travel with you, but I just don't know how we're going to get there. Can I just have your, th I don't expect you to have the answers, but your thoughts would be interesting. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I wish I, I wish I did have the answers and, and, and I don't really like, um, like everybody else. I mean, I think all I would say is that having worked very close to people in the center of government in the UK, um, in some of the previous jobs I've done, um, I was private secretary to our permanent undersecretary during the Iraq war, for example, um, when some other terrible things happened, including the Bali bombings, um, the attack on our consulate in Istanbul in which some of our staff were killed, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all I would say is that um, uh, up close, I think the people who are taking decisions 
are very often just like the rest of us and trying to do their best. And I completely recognise, you know, that's a very sort of rosy interpretation. And of course, there's all sorts of power play going on beneath that. Of course, there's vested interests and conflict of interest. But I think that fundamentally, I, I believe that people are trying to do the right thing. And that um, usually goes for our politicians and our leaders as well. Um, and certainly those experiences that I've had have only built my faith, I think, in the democratic institutions of our states, rather than, you know, made me disillusioned or, or angry, which is why I'm still doing the job that I'm doing. Um, and, you know, I think we just have to keep working together to try to reach solutions. I mean, I'm conscious I was setting out a series of principles and ideas, trying to get those implemented uh, and achieved would be a whole different ball game. But I think, you know, as our Foreign Secretary said, you've got to keep those principles with you because, and they have to be woven into our foreign policy because if they're not, then our policy is nothing and it won't actually support our own long-term national interests. So, you know, I think uh, we have to um, rely on that and keep thinking about, you know, the values that underpin our interactions with other nation states. But, I, you know, I, I take the point. Uh, it's not all easy. There are lots and lots of challenges, um, but I think these principles might help us continue to deal with them. We'll go up to the gallery, sir. I find your, your discussion very stimulating, and uh, I was particularly interested that you indicated areas where Magna Carta was, had a great influence outside the British Commonwealth, which you'd expect. My general question is, as far as international historians, are there other equivalents to Magna Carta that we, in other countries that were used to establish their rule of, of law? Because there is quite a lot of countries, and it's good to find the Magna Carta has played such an influence in those countries. But are there other documents that are in, in, of, of long vintage that are, are also equivalent to Magna Carta status? Thank you for the question. I'm looking at all the faces in the room. Everyone's doing what I'm doing and is going, hmm, let's have a think, sort of running around the world trying to, trying to think. And, and I don't know if Rosemary's got any ideas. I think it's a really good question. Um, and you know, the question you're asking really is, is Magna Carta unique in terms of our human existence in, in getting this prominence, but also spreading its wings beyond the shores of the British Isles and then even the Anglosphere? Um, I think I might have to do what parliamentarians say, take that one on notice and go away and uh, do some research. We've got, uh, Tony, do you want to offer anything? The Quran, it's a very good, very good idea. So this is Tony Brennan down here, who's our Deputy High Commissioner. He's much cleverer than me. So I've been looking at him desperately and he's just said the Quran. So I think that is a very, you know, it's a, it's a good example of the Bible, well, the I Old guess, Testament, you know, the, so. the religious text, yes, I suppose. There's another yeah. one here. French Republic documents, yes. Very new, almost still shiny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, come to the mic. I remember when I went on holiday to Iceland. Uh, they, they had a tradition in the valley where they all met the Thingvalir Valley, and they, used, they went to Denmark, I think it was, and got their law, and they brought it back to Iceland and they used to recite it. Everybody assembled and it was recited. And if you didn't correct the person who was reciting it, then the new version became the version, right? So it was very important that everybody knew what they were listening to and hauled the person up, the narrator up, if he left something out, otherwise you'd lose it. And that was done every year. But I don't know if they still do it. Well, Iceland certainly has one of the uh, ancient parliaments of the world. Uh, That's very interesting. Mm. So we can't quite answer your question, but there's a, there's a few ideas, mainly uh, ancient religious texts, I think, that have uh, stood the test of time. But we'll go away and do a, do a bit of Googling as well and see if we can come up with a better answer. Yeah. And th there would be law codes from ancient civilizations like uh, Assyria, um, ancient Greeks, codes of Solon, people such as that. But, but I think what's so profoundly moving about Magna Carta is that you have a group of incredibly self-interested barons who are out to um, um, master the king for their own, own interests. And you end up with this set of principles that, that resonates so massively 800 years later based on some very simple ideas. And uh, I think that's, that's a, 
not only a great irony, but that what one of the, the things that, that makes Magna Carta such a, a magic thing. If there are no more questions, that's um, possibly a, a point to uh, conclude our discussions. We're, and we're all going to go away and think about uh, possible equivalent uh, documents or charters to Magna Carta that have had such a, an influence on the world as that one. Um, but uh, High Commissioner, thank you. That was a, a fantastic three-act drama. I think each, each act of, of, of the, the drama um, has made us think, provided us with some information, made connections, and uh, I think like any, any audience at a, a good play, we'll all go home satisfied that we've, we've uh, <laughs> been to something very worthwhile. So I'd like you to, thank, to join me in thanking the High Commissioner for today's excellent lecture.